Thank you, everyone, for coming. I, Lewis, in the beginning of this conference, noted that it was about the relationship, in part, about the relationship of open source and the internet. And this talk, in a sense, is about that big picture and the future of openness. And I want to make a case that openness beyond uh, software really matters to whether open source is, and the open internet and open society is going to be successful in the future and can be much more successful and impactful on society than we might have currently acknowledged. So I want to I want to thank Lewis and the other organizers for inviting me and also for keeping my pseudocode title. I occasionally try to insert uh, such into my talks and they rarely get kept. Um, so I appreciate that. I will explain what it means as we go. Um, and I'm sorry I can't see any of you because of the lights, but that's just how it is in a dark room like this. Um, so I understand there won't be any Q&A, but if you would like to send me questions afterwards via Twitter, or I prefer Identica, a, a free and open and federated microblogging system, uh, there is my, my username. And also feel free to grab me after the talk. So oh, I just a uh, couple little things about me. So of course, I work for Creative Commons. Um, and start off as the CTO and I'm now vice president. Uh, before that, I was involved in an, an early open data uh, slash collaborative curation project called Bitsy. Um, and some of my background is really informed by uh, economics. And so I want to start off with a couple of slides talking about the big picture of openness, a little bit from kind of a social sciences perspective, if you will. Um, this is a quote from an economist who says that the biggest impacts on innovation are from innovations which basically make it easier to create other innovations, easier and faster. This is kind of obvious once you read it, but I think it's a pretty, it's, it's something that most people haven't thought of, I think, and it's a pretty deep insight. Um, until you actually have the insight. So I want to say that Open source and other forms of openness are actually one of these kinds of innovations. They don't just make um, innovation cheaper because you can innovate without asking for permission, but can actually speed up the rate of innovation. And over the long term, that's a huge plus for society. Another way of thinking about the same kind of thing is the big problems that we have as a society, uh, you know, whether in this case, with the quote, it's cancer or something else. We don't know the solution or we don't know how to politically arrive at the solution. So what we need to do is increase the rate at which people are doing experiments and the rate of discovery. And perhaps one of those experiments, one of those discoveries will result in a breakthrough. Um, and again, I think that's openness, open source, but other forms of openness as well, basically allow a lot more people to do, uh, to do experiments and potentially reach breakthroughs which will, which will benefit us all. You can think about that concretely in some ways. For example, with access to the scientific literature, um, when people outside of major research institutions have, have access, there's you know, potentially billions more people who, who can be discovering things. Um, but I think the, I, I think that, that's, so that's a concrete example, but I think that the impact is more systemic than that. And we can think of many examples, um, could do a whole talk on that or any of these slides. Um, a, a final quote, the most important part is that more, more people pooling resources in new ways is the history of civilization. So this is how, this is how civilization progresses from, uh, you know, just barter to, to trade to the sophisticated society that we have right now. And what is openness or open source and and other forms of openness? But 
people having figured out pretty recently how to pool resources in new ways. So uh, for some uh, context for the rest of the talk, I want to give you very, really brief, talk really brief, briefly about Creative Commons, where I work now, and that provides some of the tools for opening uh, materials other than software. So you've probably seen these buttons on web pages. If you haven't, uh, they will probably pop out at you now, or at least I hope they will. So I'll explain really briefly what they mean. They, they indicate different licenses. So many of you are probably familiar with open source licenses. They're which are copyright licenses intended for uh, opening up software. These are copyright licenses intended for opening up things other than software, which could range from scientific literature to uh, music to wikis, uh, anything really. And these range from very permissive at the top, so there's actually public domain dedication and mark, to very restrictive at the bottom. Um, the, the bottom most one only allows you to share verbatim works, uh, and not, so not modify them at all and not make money off of them. The above the green line is really what corresponds to what would be accepted as open source. And um, as you're thinking about projects and services that I'm going to encourage you to think about, I would um, stick to those in the green area because those allow a community that includes includes business, for example. Um, and the best known user of Creative Commons licenses is probably Wikipedia. It uses a license called the Attribution Sharealike, which you can see is the third one down. Um, and that's kind of the equivalent to the GPL and software in that it's a reciprocal copyleft license. Uh, so if you click through any of those buttons, you will see an explanation of what the terms of the license mean. And here's, and they're in many languages. This is one in French for that license attribution share alike that Wikipedia uses. Um, but it is, yeah, at the end of the day, a copyright license and a long, you know, a long legal text, which you can't read here, but you can see that it is long um, if you click from the deed. There is also what we call a machine-readable representation of the licenses so that you can build services which consume uh, works that have metadata about the license that they're under. The idea here is that we want computers to actually help make it easier to use free works, which is kind of in, uh, in uh, distinction to a digital rights or digital restrictions management, which tries to make your computer prevent you from you know, using, using works that are on your own computer. Uh, so here's a quick example of an annotated work. There's infinitely more detail about this on the Creative Commons site. So, um, so Creative Commons has been around for about eight years. Uh, the blue line is a very conservative estimate of the number of works under a Creative Commons license on the web. The red line indicates the proportion of those works that are under a free license. So free as in a free software or open source. Um, the, basically the licenses that were in the green a couple slides ago. So it's been pretty neat to see that growth happen from basically zero to hundreds of millions of works on the web over the years. Uh, there's been, I think, a huge amount of value created and released from that. Many, you know, many projects could not exist without a public license for, for open content or open data, for example. Um, and we see from the early days of kind of use by bloggers and photographers and musicians who wanted to share with their fans without, you know, while making a promise not to sue them, we see increasing adoption by institutions and interestingly as as policy so people who want who for example are funding projects uh, for the public benefits or paid for by taxpayers realize that they need to mandate uh, openness as part of the funding agreement so that the public in general actually benefits 
so that's, that's all very exciting progress. Um, however, I'm, it's, it's also somewhat uh, distressing that not many sectors have really been fundamentally changed in the way that free software has, has changed the software industry. Uh, it's really impossible to avoid free and open source software now. It's at least in the plumbing of almost everything, uh, perhaps unless you're 100% Microsoft shop. And even as one of the speakers yesterday morning said, they're you know opening up to open source in many ways. Um, but beyond in, beyond encyclopedias, uh, free and open things out you know outside of software nothing's been completely disrupted. Um, there's some early, there's some movement in the area of areas of scientific literature and, and educational materials, but it's a very slow progress. And in uh, what we would think of as culture, um, it's been slow indeed. So for the rest of the talk, I want to talk about how I think this has to change in other words, we need to get on a higher growth path, a more impactful and cultural, culturally relevant growth path for openness in general to reach its potential. So that includes open source. And I, I think I include, I say open star in a few subsequent slides that really just means open match anything. So open everything. Um, so first assertion I want to make is that a vibrant commons of knowledge, which means all kinds of knowledge uh, outside of software, but including software, is required basically for things that we're normally talking about at a conference like this to thrive. And so things like the open internet and open source in particular, but, but also more broadly open society. Um, second assertion, is that knowledge, and I'll say, I'll say what I mean by knowledge in particular here in a, in a minute, is slower to open, slower and harder to open than other layers such as software. And finally, that it can be done anyway and basically that we need to do it and that we can and should do it in an interest, in interesting sorts of way that don't merely just say we're going to, you know, recreate existing cultural artifacts and uh, scientific publications and educational resources, et cetera, you know, just in the same way they always have been. So in those are, that's a summary of the three assertions I just made. Um, that will say that a vibrant knowledge commons is necessary for openness in general. It's harder than some other forms of openness. And then I'm going to talk to talk about how, how we might accomplish that. So first I want to dive into really briefly what I mean by knowledge, um, which seems a little bit silly. Everybody knows what knowledge is, but uh, but for the purposes of this talk, I really mean everything that one could, can know and you know record, for example, digitally, except for software. And you know, you think about this for a few seconds, you realize that software is actually data, and software can be thought of as culture as well. But it's uh, evolved kind of ahead of the curve and somewhat separately. And in a sense, maybe this is too bad um, because it has evolved separately and ahead of the curve, and some other form, some other forms of openness are kind of having to play catch up and learn lessons from open source. Um, but that, in part, is what this talk is is about. Um, both other forms of openness playing catch up, and and also people involve people in businesses, institutions who have embraced open source already. I want to encourage you to also embrace other forms of openness. Um, so what do I, I, I talk about the knowledge commons. What do I mean by a commons? 
One definition is that it's resources governed for mutual sustainable benefit. Um, you often think about you know commons as things like uh, grazing grounds. There, there, there's a huge um, you know over the past few decades, there's a lot of economic research on on how these sorts of physical resources that a community depends on and perhaps aren't best managed purely as private property can can be can be governed for the sustain for the sustainable benefit as all well. there's an economist uh, kind of one of the leading theoreticians of this uh, Eleanor Ostrom who won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago um, and uh, which has gotten a lot more people excited about the commons um, including the knowledge or intellectual commons and I the it's often said that that knowledge including software is non rivalrous meaning that if I if you take a copy from me um, I still have my copy and occasionally that is uh, kind of thought of as an excuse not to think, I, I think, it, not, not consciously, but maybe thought a little bit as a reason that we don't have to think about how knowledge is governed. But in fact, society always has governed knowledge in most ways. Um, I'm sorry, in, mo in, all, in all ages, in many ways. Um, and it usually has governed it poorly. Um, if you think about it, it's, not, not only is knowledge something that only part of the benefit accrues to the the private person who is creating or curating the knowledge, but the kind of governance of knowledge is it's a uh, it's it's an even harder problem for society than that than than the creation and curation of individual bits of knowledge. Um, so, you know, throughout history, there's been a lot of Keeping knowledge within within the priesthood or or censorship, um, and now the main problem seems to be seems to be copyright. Um, and there's a whole kind of mythology, copyright and patents and other forms of what we call intellectual property. Um, and there's a there's a lot of mythology around that that it's needed for control. It's needed. Uh, in order for artists to create, it's needed to, uh, or there won't be invention, it's needed as an incentive. Most of that, if you look at economic and sociological literature, is just, the, just kind of myths that really justify, when it comes down to it, uh, censorship and maintenance of monopolies, monopoly rents. Um, So what? So this is where I'm going to go back to the title of this talk. I said it was pseudocode. It said require knowledge commons. So this is in, in a, many programming languages or all programming languages that have some kind of modularity, which is everything module, everything modern. There's some way of saying load me in a chunk of code or some other resource that I can use in my program. Um, and all programming languages, of course, have a way to make a comment. So the pseudocode was saying, let's say I have some code and I want access to the sum of all knowledge, as as Wikipedia says is their as is their goal. That currently, depending on what your program wants to do, or what your business wants to do, or what your community wants to do, that often doesn't work out. Um, there was a, a comment by the, the the cloud representative from Red Hat yesterday um, that I want to play off a little bit here. He said, kind of making the case for interoperability among cloud platforms, you want to be able to provision resources on the cloud as necessary. You don't want to be you don't want to be locked in. So from whatever vendor, for example. Um, so. When I say require knowledge commons, you know, I want I want to be able to access and manipulate and redistribute, et cetera, any human knowledge. Um, I mean, I want to 
basically be able to provision knowledge resources as necessary. Now, you know, this could be for any number of purposes. And gaining that capability uh, to continue to play off of the, the cloud provisioning example is not nearly as trivial as as let you know, creating a set of in, creating an, and implementing in a number of platforms a set of interoperable APIs. Again, because knowledge is not yeah, is not governed by computer programs, although computer programs can play an interesting interesting role. The rules of how knowledge is governed are really determined by society at large, both in laws and norms. Um, and one way to think about open source and other and open knowledge more generally is kind of carving out rules and norms that allow some of knowledge to be provisioned at will. Um, but you can't do that in general. Um, there'll be massive legal costs, often insurmountable. You'll get sued. You can see this most uh, obviously in the history of music startups or music internet startups over the last decade or so. Um, almost none survive, basically. Um, um, and, and the ones that do um, you know, pay tremendous rents to the existing existing music industry and um, as cool as they are, don't do anything super interesting with the music, it's just playback. Um, and you think you could do a lot more interesting things with all the technology that we have. So it's really hard, especially for businesses trying to play by the rule. And it's made worse, uh, this last uh, bullet is just kind of concretely explaining some of the ways that our governance of of knowledge as a society has has failed, especially over the last couple of decades. But it's a very well known story. Um, so now I want to expand a little bit on the arguments that the three arguments that I was making. Um, so briefly, why do I say that that open knowledge more generally is necessary for? The open for open source and the open internet that we talk about at a conference like Open World Forum. Well, I think most obviously the attacks on the open internet and also on computer science research over the last decade or so have primarily come from not have not come from proprietary software companies, for example. They've, they've come from uh, proprietary content copyright holders who have wanted to implement things like three strikes or six strikes or one strike, depending on, on where you are, um, mass lawsuits, um, again, preventing people, trying to suppress people from researching cryptography because that uh, might let people work around their uh, digital restrictions management, um, and a, a whole host of other things. So, including uh, things like search engines being able to aggregate contents in various forms. So, we we being kind of the internet industry don't lose every battle, but. It has been a very uphill. It has been a very uphill climb, let's say. And I think the industry would be much more innovative. Society would be better off um, if more knowledge was was open, so that we were not constantly fighting this uphill battle, kind of against the established content industry. Now, a little bit more subtle points: the lack of the lack of knowledge commons kind of being the default, being the default as opposed to some little corners like encyclopedias, very, very important corners, mind you, is that other forms of openness are really disadvantaged. If you think about uh, free software on the desktop, for example, um, you, uh, 
cannot play, you cannot use it, at least not in its pure form, for many popular cultural sites because there's not, for example, a digital restrictions management um, implementation for, uh, for Netflix, for example. So on top of all of the other kind of network effects barriers that, that, we, that we face, at least in, in some more consumer-oriented domains, um, the kind of lack of availability of, of our culture on free platforms really hinders their adoption. And then I, I think that the most important point is really about the open, is really the open society part. Um, free society needs free speech. So it's really distressing that the, con go going a little bit back to the first part, the content industry's attacks on the internet in the West are looked upon with glee by by less free, by less open governments, uh, typically not in the West, um, because they would love to use the same tools, the same kind of filtering tools to uh, not very, not indirectly, but very directly suppress political speech. And I think that sets a terrible example and creates a terrible set of infrastructure. Um, and this would be a powerful enough, you know, reason even if we didn't care about the open net and open source kind of for our own sake as, as, uh, as advocates of open source and as developers and as internet entrepreneurs. So I've said several times uh, that open source has progressed more quickly than other forms of openness. I, I think there are probably some there there are probably some good reasons for this. I think that this is a an interesting topic for research. But here's some conjectures as to why this is the case. Um, one is kind of the generational length. Um, technology generations happen relatively quickly. So there's always an opportunity with every new generation of devices, for example, for a better technology to win out. And better could mean lots of things. We realize that uh, with open source, it's not you know, just the functionality of the technology, but it's the ability to choose among vendors to participate in a, in a community that has good governance and doesn't have lock-in and all of those things. But in any case, if we're thinking of better very broadly, there are many opportunities, you know, in, in the technology life cycle for better to win. And you can see in sector after sector after sector over the last, uh, say, you know, 20 years that free and open source software has, has won. And, you know, many of you are, have businesses building on that stack that has won. In the case of in the case of other forms of knowledge, often the life cycle is much longer. In the case of popular culture, it's basically a lifetime. You establish your taste, you know, as a teenager probably. And then even if somebody makes music that is a freely licensed, that if there were a objective set of quality criteria, um, would be just as good, you're addicted to the music you learned as a teenager, and that happens to be owned 100% by typically the major, by the major labels. So there's essentially no hope of, of culture being free for you ever, you know, without dramatically, without dramatic changes in, in copyright law. So. Um, and you can see in other, even in non-popular culture, longer, uh, longer generational effects where, um, you know, in the case of scientific communications, uh, there's everybody wants to publish in the top ranked journals and it is very, there, there's kind of no defined product cycle for dislodging, for dislodging those, those top journals, um, which you know, are only top journals because they're top journals and and it's prestigious to publish there basically, not because they necessarily have better peer review, for example. So 
it's, uh, you, you can't depend on a technology cycle to be able to say, well, here's something better and let's disrupt. You have to come up with something truly disruptive, you know, as, as again, that, you know, Wikipedia did with encyclopedias. And that's a much bigger, a bigger challenge than just creating something that is better in the current generation like you can in software. Um, of course, not that software isn't hard. We all know that it's very, very difficult. But I just want to emphasize that some other forms of knowledge are even harder. Um, there's also more pure network effects in um, some other some other forms of knowledge than there is in software. And again, the the popular music and scientific communications examples are are just right. There's uh, there, there are some sociological studies that, that indicate that, you know, really the, the quality of music that people really like is that other people like it. Um, so you can't, again, you can't really make better music that it's free because you have to, it, because your enjoyment of the music really depends on other people liking it and you having it heard a bunch. So. Um, and software, of course, they're very strong network effects, but they're not that strong. Um, you can build you can build a solution that's interoperable with old software. You can build software that's actually that's better in more objective terms than can be said for a culture. Um, and again, with scientific public publication, you know, the that's, that really is pure network effects. You want to be publishing where everybody else who's top in your field is publishing. And it's, you know, just kind of path dependent and random as to which journal that happens to be. But whoever owns that journal has, you know, an incredible uh, gravy, chain, gravy chain they're writing on. So finally, there's more distance between producers and consumers in fields other than software. So in, in software, often programmers are pretty uh, pretty direct consumers of software, or at least people who can be programmers. For example, system administrators, you know, can make a lot of decisions. And, you know, obviously, and often CIOs and CTOs were pretty recently in their career were, were developers, whereas, in other forms of of knowledge, I'll, I'll stick with cult, with uh, kind of popular music and scientific knowledge as as and scientific communication as good examples. There's great distance between the uh, producers and consumers and packagers, or essentially between those two. Um, you know, with with music, there's a set of with popular music anyway, there's a big set of intermediaries who primarily market the music and pa and and package it. Um, and consumers are just pure consumers in this case. They simply consume the marketing and buy the music or or acquire the music. Um, in the case of scientific communication, um, yeah, the researchers submit papers to journals, but then they're not involved in buying the journals at all. That's the university library if you know if they're or if they're lucky that to be at a rich at a rich university. So now I think the, the most interesting so that paints kind of a sad picture of some of the barriers um, to opening up other forms of knowledge. And two slides ago I talked about why I think I think it is necessary for realizing the benefits of open and, and for keeping society open. Um, now I'm going to talk about some, some tentative ways that we might pursue um, catching up with open source and working with open source and entrepreneurs who are building businesses on, on open source um, in order to move ahead. So one is policy. So one of one of the ways that I mentioned that uh, Creative Commons and other uh, advocates of of open knowledge are are gaining quite a bit of traction is with policymakers, so institutional and and government. Um, 
and it oh I I see I only have two minutes left so I will have to apologies I miss I was misreading that the whole time um, um, so I, I there there are also a lot of efforts in in open source to uh, advocate for open standards and good procurement policies and such I think this is one area where we can collaborate these two uh, communities can collaborate very directly together because the, the rationale basically uh, public funding public be benefit uh, you know no reason for public funding to create monopolies applies to both so I want to think about collaboration tools and and vision so this is this is the part where I don't want to just recapitulate the same products that have been created for decades that have kind of been translated from physical into digital but we should be we should be look as we're you know building businesses and communities and tools etc we should be looking for ways to to leverage collaboration sometimes mass collaboration um, to create new product categories or, or new efficiencies uh, one analogy to this is revision control and distributed revision control now open source kind of existed before I mean there's a long kind of proto history and it existed before uh, you know people were even using CVS but it was a big pain um, and CVS and then subversion those are big uh, efficiency boosters and now gets in other distributed ver revision control systems you know have really changed the way that that free and open source software is developed so we need to think about how to use these tools for building you know at literally using git for example to manage uh, cultural artifacts but also what are some what are some analogous tools that we can build um, then uh, in the last seconds I want to talk uh, think about how your business or tool can engage in the provisioning sharing and servicing knowledge um, I think there's there's a lack of tools like that and finally uh, we need to eat our own dog food and I don't have time but I will I will uh, make a blog post expanding on these ideas that I think are somewhat self-evident um, in the last second I'll just say intellectual pro think of intellectual provenance and building that into your tools uh, that is a service to both readers and authors intellectual and it's also a good uh, transformation of IP into something that's useful for society thank you very much the session recording you saw at the bottom right of the video is courtesy Open World Forum. Thanks to them for posting it under a Creative Commons attribution license. Thanks also to Open World Forum co-president Louis Montaigne and Knowledge Commons track leader Florence DeVard for inviting me. All other content in this video is dedicated to the public domain. At my blog, you can find a post following up and expanding on the ideas in the last couple of slides that I rushed through. Also, if I had time at the end, I would have given a plug to Creative Commons France since Open World Forum was in Paris, France. I encourage you to visit their website and keep up with their activities. Thanks a lot.